All right, good afternoon, everyone. Just a few things at the top, and then I will uh, be happy to take your questions. So first, the department continues to stay fully engaged with FEMA, as well as other federal, state, and local agencies to support the whole of government recovery efforts related to Hurricane Helene, and have begun preparations to respond to Hurricane Milton, providing capabilities that best support those needs as identified by the governors in each of the affected states. As previously mentioned, in North Carolina, we've deployed over 1,500 active duty soldiers helping with emergency route clearance, rotary wing search and rescue, and the delivery of food, water, and other needed resources to residents in the hardest affected areas in Western North Carolina. On top of that, you have the U.S. Corps of Engineers, who have nearly 500 personnel manning 12 emergency operations centers throughout the areas impacted by Hurricane Helene, to include three of those in North Carolina. We know the foundation of our uniformed response comes from our National Guard, who now have roughly 5,000 Guard members from 19 different states doing just phenomenal work across the board serving these impacted communities. And in Florida, more than 5,000 members of the Florida National Guard have been mobilized to prepare for recovery efforts from the imminent arrival of Hurricane Milton. Additionally, U.S. Army North is preparing high water vehicles, helicopters for search and rescue operations, force, forces logistics support to FEMA search and rescue teams, medium lift helicopters for moving personnel and equipment and command and control and sustainment for DOD forces, and has moved personnel and equipment from their contingency command post to Fort Moore, Georgia, as they stand ready to respond to support requests from FEMA and state leadership. Shifting gears, this morning, Secretary Austin spoke by phone with Japan's Minister of Defense, Nakatani. Secretary Austin congratulated Ms. Minister Nakatani on his recent appointment at a time when the United States and Japan continue to make historic progress on alliance priorities. The two officials reaffirmed their commitment to modernize alliance command and control and expand bilateral presence in Japan's Southwest Islands. They also reiterated the importance of deepening defense cooperation with regional partners to advance a shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific region. Secretary Austin also spoke by phone today to new NATO Secretary General Mark Ruta. The Secretary congratulated him on his recent appointment as the Alliance's new Secretary General, and the leaders reaffirmed their commitment to advancing NATO's priorities. Readouts of both calls will be available on defense.gov later today. On Secretary Austin's bilat with Minister Gallant, we were just informed that Minister Gallant will be postponing his trip to Washington, D.C. Secretary Austin looks forward to seeing him soon. And finally, as many of you are aware, Due to Hurricane Milton, President Biden is no longer traveling to Ramstein to participate in the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. We are still working through what that means for the Secretary's schedule, but when we have an update, we'll be happy to share. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Um, I don't see AP. AP is on the phone. Lita Baldor, Associated Press. Hi, thanks, Sabrina. Um, on the uh, postponing of the Gallant visit, uh, do you have any sense um, whether this impacts, has an impact on what Israel may or may not do um, regarding strikes um, on, on Iran at all? And has the secretary, did the secretary speak with him or is there a call on that plan? Um, thanks, Lita, uh, for the question. So in terms of impact on um, Israel's response, again, I'm, you know, I'm not going to speak for the Israelis and, and their operations. Um, we certainly can remain in touch, whether it be in person uh, via a meeting, uh, should that be you know, scheduled for a later time, or via phone. Um, I'm not aware that the Secretary has spoken to Minister Gallant today, but of course, um, you know, it's still early, and um, they're in touch pretty frequently, so a call could always be scheduled for later today or later this week. Um, and that being said, we still continue to consult with the Israelis on, you know, what their response might be. But I'm just not going to speculate further uh, beyond what I said. I'll come into the room. Jen. So what was the reason that uh, Minister Gallant gave for, for canceling the trip? You'd have to speak to the Israelis on that one. I was just told that, the, the, that he postponed his trip. How much equipment has CENTCOM moved out of Tampa? How many warplanes, ships, what, what's happening? And have they moved all personnel out or are they keeping a skeleton staff? 
Uh, so in terms of act, so in terms of how much equipment has been moved from CENTCOM, um, from MacDill, um, I would refer you them to speak to that. I don't have those specific numbers, but I know that they've taken a number of precautions to move um, aircraft out, um, you know, taking protective measures. Um, there is an evacuation order in place. Um, I believe there will be, you know, a uh, only essential personnel needed at the base during this time. But uh, for the most part, I think most folks are, you know, following those orders and, and leaving the, the affected area. But can the op center stay open and function if there's a massive hurricane? Is it protected? And what impact will it have on U.S. operations in the Middle East in the coming days? So in terms of operations in the Middle East, uh, I do not anticipate any impacts to forces and um, you know our operations in the Middle East. They're going to continue to um, be able to conduct those missions. Um, in terms of how the op center will be able to operate, I'd really refer you to CENTCOM to speak to that. I just don't have that level of detail from here. Warren, did I see you? Yeah. Um, two questions. You say you don't have a readout of a call today between Secretary Austin and Minister Gallant. Uh, do we expect the pace of calls to continue as it has? And is there something the Secretary um, wanted to convey to Gallant in person that cannot be conveyed in a phone call. Meaning, is there a, is, is there, in other words, will the, will the in-person meeting simply turn into a phone call now that it's delayed, and do you have any sense of how long it's being delayed? I don't have a sense of how long it's, uh, Minister Gallant's visit has been postponed. I refer you to the Israeli Ministry of Defense to speak to that. Um, no, there's nothing that can't be discussed over the phone that can uh, be di discussed in person. Um, certainly in-person visits allow for just, you know, deepening of the relationship, being in person. Um, the question that Lita had asked me was, has the secretary spoken to Minister Gallant today? And I just am not aware of any call that has taken place. That being said, there always could be one that lands on the books for later today, later this week, next week. I think you know that they remain in regular touch. Um, I'll see about that. Yes, Charlie. Um, I'm curious to know uh, who initiated uh, Gallant's visit here to begin with. Was he beckoned by the Secretary of Defense, or was it maybe his idea that maybe they needed to have a face-to-face? -face? I don't think the Secretary of Defense beckons anyone. Um, this was a visit that was scheduled uh, by Minister Gallant, and of course the Secretary would always love to host him at the Pentagon, and that's what we were going to do tomorrow. The visit's been postponed, and we'll work with Minister Gallant's um, office you know, should his trip um, be rescheduled to a later date, I'm sure the secretary would be happy to host him again at the Pentagon. But it was Minister Gallant's idea to come visit. It, Minister Gallant was traveling to the to the U.S. and the secretary welcomed here, him to the Pentagon to host him here for a bilateral meeting. Joe. Thank you, Sabrina. I guess you are aware of some reports are saying that Prime Minister Netanyahu asked uh, Minister Gallant not to go to to Washington. <coughs> Uh, I guess you are aware of that, and if you have anything to say in regards to those reports. Thanks uh, for the question. I am aware of those reports, and I think I'm going to stay out of Israeli politics. I mean, uh, would, you, could, would you rule out such a thing between uh, U.S.-Israel relations? I don't have any comment on the reporting that's coming out of um, the region. What I can tell you is that the Secretary has a, a great relationship with Minister Gallant. Um, I think they've now spoken probably over 80 times, ballpark. Um, you know, th they, they remain in constant communication, uh, whether it be an in-person meeting here or, you know, meetings, phone calls that need to be done remote, um, that relationship still maintains and can be done, you know, at any time, any place in the world, including when the secretary is back on, you know, has been on travel and taken uh, calls, you know, over the mid-Atlantic. Okay, uh, my last question is, uh, we all know that uh, Secretary Austin was planning to go to Israel, and then he canceled it. And then now, Minister Gallant was planning to come to the Pentagon tomorrow, and then it got postponed. Would you say, can we say, is it fair to say that there are kind of tension between both Secretary Austin and Minister Gallant? No, to the contrary, I, I mean, I would push push back on that. I don't think there's tension. I don't think, you know, you can have, um, you can have frank, you can have direct conversations with your friends. You're not always going to agree on everything, but um, that doesn't mean that there's tensions. I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't read into anything there. So I'm going to, okay, so the, the another question. The same page. Can we say that? I, I, I 
Could you expand on what you mean by they're not on the same page? In regards to, let's say, uh, in regards to how Israel is going to strike back on Iran. What I will tell you, Joe, is that we are talking to them about their response. I wouldn't read too much into uh, that other than that's all I'm going to be able to say at this moment. Fadi. So thank you, Sabrina. You said you, you were going to stay out of Israeli politics. Yeah. Um, are Israeli politics getting in the way of your consultation with the Israelis on the potential response to Iran? And I'm asking this question because any response by Israel, uh, whether in Lebanon or Iran, as you said, uh, or Pentagon officials, will have an impact on U.S. forces and U.S. interests in the region. Mm -hmm. So the, so in terms of the question on the, the Minister Gallant's visit, I just, I've seen the reporting coming out of the region. I just don't have anything to add to that, and I don't have anything to, com to add additional comments on. Um, in terms of a response from Israel to Iran, um, it's something that we're, you know, continuing to hear from them, understanding that you know they they are also thinking through how they're going to respond but i'm just not going to speculate on what a response might look like okay and a follow-up mm -hmm. at this moment uh with the tensions uh what's happening in lebanon what's mm -hmm. happening in in gaza in terms of the renewed uh, uh, israeli offensive on uh, northern part of the strip um tension between iran and israel does the secretary think it was it is helpful for the Israelis to postpone the Alliance visit? What does that have to do with um, tensions? Was it is it helpful uh, to postpone Galan's visit to the Pentagon? Was he going to uh, he was going to discuss all of these topics? And I'm just my my question is. Do you think that will have an impact on the depth of discussions? No, it's not going to have an impact. We have a phone. We've spoken, uh, the secretary has spoken to Minister Galan, I think, you know, probably more than 80 times. Don't, you know, quote me on that. Although I'm saying it from a podium, so I guess you can. Um, but, you know, a approximately over 80 times he's spoken to Minister Galan. Um, they have a, you know, a good relationship with each other, Fadi. They can pick up the phone at any time, at any hour of the night, um, and speak very candidly to each other, whether that's a meeting that's done in person or a meeting that's done over the phone. Um, it's a conversation. And uh, no matter what, that's something that um, I think both sides can appreciate. So I don't think that Minister Gallant postponing his trip, um, I wouldn't read too much into that other than that it's postponed, is what we've been told. And the secretary will welcome him to the Pentagon when he's in the United States. Okay, if I may ask a question mm -hmm. about Gaza, finally. Sure. Um, uh, so the administration position and the secretary was very clear that um, you don't want to see uh, uh, a permanent uh, expulsion of uh, or occupation of northern Gaza or pushing the population out of that uh, uh, that part of the strip. However, um, based on the available information and what local authorities are saying, uh, they're asking three hospitals to evacuate, Kamar Adwan, Landonisi, and al -Auda. These hospitals have been supporting the population in the northern part of Gaza. What is your understanding of uh, what's happening in terms of Israeli operation there? So, Fadi, I, I can't confirm. I'm, I appreciate that you're telling me that. I just I don't have any reporting on that. I ha don't have anything to, um, you know, I, I just am not aware of that. Um, what I can tell you is that um, the secretary has been very clear, and we've said this both publicly and privately, that when it comes to the battle space, making sure that civilians are taken into account and making sure that the civilians are moved out of the battle space is something that the secretary continues to impress upon Minister Gallant, and not just from this building, but other buildings in this administration also continue to reiterate that message. Um, so while I can't comment on those specifics, I, I really just haven't seen those reports. Um, I would say that, you know, we've been pretty clear and firm on our position from the beginning when it comes to civilians in the battle space. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, since you called for a ceasefire in Lebanon about two weeks ago, uh, things have really deteriorated in Lebanon, in Beirut specifically, mm -hmm. and Israel is bombing the residential areas every single night live on TV. So on that, mm -hmm. considering that you also called for a ceasefire, are you supportive of what you've seen so far from Israel? Do you approve of all of that? And are you supporting <laughs> what's been unfolding so far? So we're supportive of Israel targeting um, 
Lebanese Hezbollah. And I think I, I'd remind you that, you know, we're one year from October 8th of last year when Hezbollah started launching rockets into Israel following the October 7th attack. So in terms of, you know, um, Israel has a right to um, respond and target Lebanese Hezbollah, but it has to be in a way that, of course, um, takes into account civilians in the area. And to Fadi's point, um, minimizes civilians, civilian casualties and, and takes into account that those civilians in the battle space. So um, that's something that, you know, the secretary, you can look back at our many readouts that we've put up, but that's something that he's, you know, pretty much brings up in every single call. Regarding the uh, imminent Israeli attack on Iran that's expected, you always said so far, if, if I remember correctly, we are in for the defense of Israel, but mm -hmm. we're not going to be attacking jointly with Israel. So far, you've refrained from ruling that out. Can you, are you in a position to say we're not going to be joining an Israeli military operation against Iran for this retaliation? We've been pretty clear that we don't seek war with Iran. Um, we're going to talk with the Israelis about their response. Again, a response that hasn't happened. I'm just not going to speculate any further. Carl, cool, yeah. I'm going to go to Carl. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on your topper, there is a NATO defense ministerial next week, mm -hmm. I believe the 17th and 18th. Um, is the Pentagon considering lumping in the UDCG, the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, at that ministerial in order to, to continue having one this month? Carla, as I mean, as I mentioned, we're just figuring this out right now. So, I, you know, when there's more updates to provide, I certainly will. But um, you know, the president just pulled down his trip this morning. So again, we're, we're working through those details. When we have more, we'll provide it. And then since it is now one year since the massacre, the Hamas massacre on October 7th, um, there have been some criticisms that, that wiping out and destroying Hamas in Gaza is an unrealistic goal. Does the Pentagon agree with those criticisms? I'm sorry, like going like going after Hamas and Gaza, we've been pretty clear um, that Israel has an absolute right to, in terms of defending itself, going after those terrorists that attacked Israel and killed innocent um, civilians, you know, over a year ago now. Um, how success is defined, that's something for Israel to really define. And that's not something that the United States can define. Um, but they have every right to continue to go after um, Hamas that we know continues to operate in Gaza, continues to hold hostages that haven't been able to come home for you know more than a year now, um, and continues to put innocent Palestinians in harm's way by you know embedding in civilian infrastructure. Um, Israel also must make sure that they're protecting civilians as they prosecute their campaign against Hamas. Janie. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, two questions. It was reported that uh, North Korean military officers uh, were confirmed that six persons and three were wounded in Russian occupied territory due to a Ukraine missile attack. What do you think about North Korean militaries fighting for Russia's war in Ukraine? So I haven't seen those reports, Janie, so I can't confirm that. Um, in terms of support to Russia, I mean, we've certainly seen North Korea willing to support Russia um, by military means. Um, it's something that we continue to monitor, but what we're more concerned about is supporting Ukraine and what it needs to be successful on the battlefield. Um, and you're going to see us continue to do that. Today, uh, South Korea's defense minister said that uh, since North Korea and Russia have uh, established a mutual military cooperation relationship, there is a possibility that additional North Korean troops will be dispatched to Russia. How does the U.S. view this? Yeah, Janie, I don't have anything more to add other than what I said. I, I'm not aware of these reports that you're citing, so I just really can't offer further comment on it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Uh, there were some reports of explosion, explosions in the city of Isfahan in Iran last night. Do you have any sort of understanding whether, whether it was a military exercise or it was a retaliatory attack by Israel? 
I'm not uh, tracking that that was any type of retaliatory attack, but I don't know what those explosions were. So I, I, I just don't have anything more to add to that. And uh, are you with your Israeli partners still assessing a response to Iran attack? Yes, I think we are still, uh, I uh, have said this pretty um, clearly from a, a few folks that have asked in the room, but we're still talking to them about their response. I'm just not going to speculate further on what that might look like. And lastly, mm -hmm. uh, nowadays Iranian proxies in Iraq uh, frequently attack Israel. I mean, they launch drones and missiles toward Israel. Do you think they shifted their strategy from attacking U.S. personnel and attacking Israel? I'm sorry, was the first part of your question on groups in... Yeah, Iranian in proxies in Iraq. And, and Syria? They frequently, you know, mm -hmm. uh, launch uh, drones towards Israel. And do you think they changed their strategy to attack Israel rather than U.S. personnel in Iraq? I think we've seen them attack, whether it be U.S. forces or try and attack a launch attacks towards Israel pretty much from the beginning. Um, I can't speak for their strategy. I'm certainly not going to speak on behalf of those groups. Um, but we've seen this type of behavior pretty consistently from the beginning. And what you've also seen us do is continuing to engage um, and shoot down, whether it be you know missiles or drones that are launched, whether it be from Iraq or Syria. Um, our forces have shot those down before um, and will continue to do so in our self-defense and also in Israel's. Yeah. Is there any discussion between this building and the Iraqi government over the Iraqi militia group's involvement into this conflict? We saw the Iraqi prime minister send a public message to President Biden and he was talking about to shielding Iraq from this conflict. So is there any discussion <coughs> between you and the Iraqi government to raid these groups and to make Iraq stay away from this war? I don't have any conversations to read out from the secretary, but we're certainly always in touch with our Iraqi counterparts. Um, something that, I mean, what you've heard us say from, you know, since these attacks started launching on October 17th, was that we would take measures to defend our forces. That's what we're going to continue to do. And we're going to keep saying that both publicly and privately, um, because we will take defensive measures um, if we are attacked. Another question on Iraq. ISIS has increased its activity in Iraq, especially in disputed area, disputed area between the Kurdistan region and Iraq. On Wednesday, an analysis in an ISIS ambush in Kirkuk killed four Iraqi uh, soldiers. So what's your latest, latest assessment on ISIS threats, and do you think the conflict in the Middle East uh, has any impact on the resurgence of ISIS in Iraq? The conflict, the regional tensions, of course, are going to have an impact on how groups calculate um, and consider their attacks, whether it be on U.S. forces or um, other governments in the region. Um, the threat of ISIS has certainly evolved from what it was, um, you know, 10 years ago. Today, that threat looks different, which is why you've seen us change our relationship and the, inv the involvement from the global coalition to defeat ISIS, the, the, the military arm of that is changing to a bilateral security agreement with the Iraqi government. That is a phased approach. It's going to take time. Um, during these conversations, no one is under the impression that ISIS isn't still a threat in the region. Um, it's how it's it's how that threat has changed over the course of time. So um, yes, acknowledging that ISIS still remains a threat. And that's why you have U.S. forces that are partnered with um, Iraqi security forces to defeat that threat of ISIS and to ensure their defeat going forward. Yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, I will go back to Mr. Golan's visit uh, issue. Uh, despite that, you mentioned that you have good communication uh, with them and uh, two ministers, they call each other uh, very often. Um, the secretary declared that he caught off guard when they killed Hassan Nasrallah. So given the sensitivity of these times <coughs> that Israel could uh, attack um, Iran and other issues on the table, um, are you confident that you won't be caught off guard again uh, under these circumstances? We're confident that we're going to continue to engage the Israelis, whether it be here in person at the Pentagon or over the phone. Um, Again, when it comes to their response, I'm just not going to speculate any further. Nancy. 
Um, I had two questions. Sure. Israel um, conducted um, strikes in, a, in a, a suburb in Damascus. Was the U.S. in any way involved in those strikes, providing any support? I'm sorry, I'm not tracking the strikes, so I just don't have more to provide at this time. And then there were intercepts conducted by the U.S. during Iran's um, ballistic missile attack on Israel. Mm -hmm. Do you have an update on how many of those were successfully uh, able to stop uh, missiles from reaching Israel? I don't have an assessment yet. I know that was ongoing um, and that Central Command was was doing their assessment. I think, you know, given also the hurricane, there's some um, there might be some delays in us getting you some information. I'm happy to follow up with um, I'm sure everyone is interested. So I'm happy to follow up on that. Um, but I would you know, also leave it to CENTCOM to allow them to finish their assessment, and it might just take a little bit more time. Yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Sabrina. Um, has the U.S. military has had any discussion with Pakistan in case uh, things flare up between Israel and Iran? Um, I mean, there's always mill-to-mill -mill communications and conversations that happen. I'm not tracking anything at the secretary's level, though. Okay. Um, uh, this Indian uh, senior journalist claimed that there are about 15,000 Indian uh, contractors in Israel right now. Um, do you think having more of these contractors uh, would have decre uh, decreased the number of uh, children and innocent people killed uh, in Gaza if this approach of ground troops was uh, decided in the early days? I just don't have anything to add to that, and I, I'm not aware of contractors being on the ground or... Ground operations since day one uh, in Gaza, do you think that would have de decreased the number of innocent being killed or no? By a different countries. Israel, Israel having, a, having a small military, you know, if they had these contractors, like right now they have about 15,000 of them from India, do you think that would have uh, decreased the I, number? I, yeah, I just can't speculate on the past, and I, I'm not aware of, you know, contractors and how that would play into the approach. I, you know, again, for Israel's operations and how they're conducting their own operations, whether it be in Gaza or on the border, I'd refer you to Israel to speak to that. Just last question. Uh, just right now, I'm coming from the State Department. My colleague Rita had asked Matt this question that 23 years ago, the U.S. went to Afghanistan because of Al-Qaeda. And today there are reports that Al Qaeda is again growing in that region. I have raised this question. I've been raising this question for a year now. Uh, Pakistan and the U, uh, Afghanistan and the U.S. Uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan foreign offices are now even having uh, tussle with each other. Uh, in the midst of all this, is the Pentagon taking this at all serious that Al Qaeda is growing to a strength where? over the horizons operations might not be enough uh, to tackle this challenge? We certainly take it seriously. We remain incredible capability in the region, which as you mentioned, include over the horizon capabilities. Don't have more to add. Jared, did you have something? Yes, I just, I just want to clarify something at the top. Or, um, you mentioned the DOD was just informed of the defense minister's uh, mm -hmm. postponed visit. Uh, did the I'm Israeli- not give you a exact time. No, but did, did, did the uh, Israeli defense ministry contact DOD officials and confirm that, or did you guys learn that from press reports? We were contacted by the Israeli ministers, Ministry of Defense. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I just wanted to ask, um, so the department, I mean, do you expect to be informed ahead of the, uh, you, know, you mentioned the conversations will continue, do you expect to be informed of the nature and the timing of the strike or the retaliation against Iran before that occurs? Appreciate the question, Jared. Um, again, we're in constant communication with the Israeli government uh, at different levels including the secretary to Minister Gallant. We're going to keep talking to them about their response. I'm just not going to be able to get into more details beyond that. Brad. Yeah, just one question. So now that Israel um, is operating inside of Lebanon and Israel and Iran are basically trading strikes, are we in that wider war that you've been trying to prevent or do you still assess that it's contained? We still assess it as contained. Um, what we are seeing is limited operations on that northern border to clear that Hezbollah infrastructure to allow Israeli citizens to get back into that northern area. This has not spread out into a wider regional conflict. Um, I understand the implication of your question, but it still has been contained to Gaza. Um, they still have a right to conduct operations against Hezbollah, which a year from today, uh, looking back, um, Hezbollah started launching rockets towards Israel. So yes, 
our assessment is that this conflict still remains contained and we are doing everything from our per- from our perspective to ensure that um, it does remain contained and that the message of deterrence is still sent far and wide. And that's why you've seen us rotate out different carriers through the region. Um, you know, we still have the ARGMU in the Eastern Mediterranean. We have flown in different capabilities. We have a lot of power in the region. Um, and we will use that if needed to protect U.S. forces. And should we see another attack from Iran, we will also come to the defense of Israel. Previously, you were saying if it moved into Lebanon, it would be a wider war. You were trying to prevent that. So how is that not? We still do not assess that this is a wider war, though. What they are doing is clearing um, and creating a, a I'm trying to think of the right words, but a zone in which they can safely get their citizens back who have been displaced from the attacks that Hezbollah started launching on October 8th. Um, again, that was the next day following a brutal terrorist attack that killed you know, many innocent people and following that day that also, um, you know, we still have hostages uh, in Gaza. So um, they have every right to go after, um, you know, a terrorist organization that is on their border that started launching attacks on October 8th. And I might remind you that these same terrorists that um, you know started those attacks on October 8th, some of them are responsible also for the death of Americans. So I, I think it's time to just put things in perspective here. The war is still, as we assess, it's still contained. I see a question over here. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you may have seen published reports that the Israel has now several dozen military vehicles and an unknown number of troops uh, adjacent to or surrounding the UNIFIL, uh, United Nations Peacekeeping Force in southern Lebanon. Um, What is the Pentagon's view of this apparently intimidating behavior by the Israelis and has the uh, Pentagon uh, warned the Israelis to uh, keep their, uh, to to not attack uh, that base with its uh, approximately 300 Irish soldiers? I haven't seen those reports, so I'm, I'm sorry. You're reading it to me as I'm up here. Um, I, so I, I'm not aware of this. What I can tell you is what what I can tell you is what I know, in that they are conducting operations along that northern border that has um, infrastructure that Hezbollah uses. Um, I'm going to let you reach out to the Israeli government to speak on behalf of their own operations. I can just give you a very top level assessment of of what they have told us. Yes, in the back. Um, are you tracking any reports by Hezbollah that um, credible threats that they would attack deeper into Israel? And if so, is there any reaction or thinking about that? So I'm not going to speak to intelligence assessments, but we have seen them launch, you know, attacks previously from um, within Lebanon that you know could be assessed to reach deeper into Israel that have been you know intercepted by Israeli air defenses. But I just don't have a wider assessment for you. Did I see one more here? Uh, yes. I wanted to follow on from Jen's question. So sure. The Command Center for America's, might be argued, most dynamic region, CENTCOM, mm-hmm. McDill, it's been shut down, disrupted, at least moved 6,000 personnel or more. Is there a sort of dedicated fallback facility for those instances? I know it was shut down for Elaine as, as well, or Elaine. And then uh, secondly, um, can McDill itself um, does it have the defenses to withstand uh, a storm of this magnitude? I think those are great questions, Charlie, and I don't want to give you the wrong information. I honestly just don't have that here. I would refer you to McDill to speak to that. What I can tell you is we're never going to allow our operations around the world to be disrupted. So there will be a continuity. Um, command and control will still be you know, operational. The missions will still continue wherever they are around the world um, that uh, you know, CENTCOM has you know, purview over. Um, but for more specifics on the the center that Jen, you know, asked about, I would just refer you to CENTCOM more to speak to that as I just don't have those operational details in front of me. But what I can tell you is, is I know that some people are evacuating, obviously, because of the storm. You know, want to make sure our personnel are taken care of. But for more on the facility itself, I'd refer you to McDill to speak to that. Is General Carrillo back at CENTCOM? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. I got one and then two and then we'll wrap up yeah um, in advance of uh, hurricane milton what how many active duty forces or equipment is on standby ready to to deploy if needed called upon 
capture. So already we have 5,000 National Guard that are already mobilized. Um, in terms of Hurricane Milton, um, there's already been preparatory action that's been taken that I sort of read out at the top, but um, we have pre-positioned helicopters for search and rescue operations. We have high water vehicles for search and rescue and commodities distribution. Um, there are personnel to help with logistics support and additional search and rescue operations. So we're doing things that, uh, or the National Guard, I should say, is doing things um, to be in place and to be ready to support, um, you know, it, almost immediately. Uh, and for more, I'd you know, refer you to Florida to speak to that. Fadi, last one? Uh -huh. so in terms of putting things in perspective, uh, the UN and Lebanese authorities <clears throat> just you know, are saying 1,500 Lebanese civilians have been killed only in the last two weeks since this Israel operation started. 1.2 million of the population are displaced, which is almost quarter of the population. Israel yesterday issued new warnings, basically laying a siege the Lebanese waters from the Awali River to the south, which is 60 kilometers deep. Uh, tens of evacuation orders from the southern uh, parts of Lebanon, striking in Tripoli in the north, Beirut every night, Bekaa in the east, Saida on the coastal. Is this, does this sound like a limited operation in its impact? And we. We heard a lot from you here on the podium that the Israeli operation in Gaza, in Rafah, was limited. And now we know almost 40% of that city was destroyed. How is that operation, from your perspective, and Lebanon is limited if the impact is so devastating on the country? Fadi, what I can tell you is that, um, you know, we understand that um, there's certainly been impacts to civilians, and civilians have been displaced. Um, there have been, um, you know, whether it be in Gaza or in Lebanon, there are civilians that are getting caught in the battle space. And that is something that we have continuously urged the Israelis when they are conducting their operations. They have to take into account civilians. Um, we are not on the ground conducting these operations. So again, I can't speak to the operations itself. I can just speak to what we are here doing at the department and what we're going to continue to do. And the secretary is going to continue to impress upon Minister Gallant that civilians need to be accounted for in the battle space. In terms of their operations, from what we understand, Fadi, it is still limited. Um, we're going to have a conversation at some point with Minister Gallant um, more about what you know th these operations look like, but our understanding is that they are limited and um, constricted to that border, uh, you know, northern border area. Um, and we're going to keep, you know, these are these are very direct conversations between two people, um, and we're going to continue to have them. Okay, thanks, everyone.